Well, it really is a privilege for me to be here with you. I, I do bring greetings from my own her, uh, home church, Harvest Bible Chapel, London, and I feel like I'm uh, joining a uh, family today. I want you to know this church is special to me. Uh, it's special to me for a lot of reasons. Um, I was reminded of it last year when I joined with you for your 10th anniversary. Uh, just to be able to celebrate a little bit about what God had been doing and has been doing in your midst for 10 years. And just as we were singing right now, I had a perspective I didn't even have last year or even the last two services. And Paul, I was thinking back to some of those early prayer meetings 11 years ago, and we were praying about what God might do here. And we didn't know. We didn't know. And then just worshiping with you now, I realized God had his eyes on you. And God had his eyes on working in your life, changing you, and this is the vision. So praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I want you to know this is also a special place to me uh, because of my friendship with your pastor, uh, Paul, and you need to know that he has been a source of wisdom and encouragement and friendship uh, to me, and uh, we've been able to work together on a lot of things within the larger fellowship together, but I'm, I'm thankful to him uh, for that. I am also very, very thankful to the Lord for his provision in Paul and Sue's life this summer through uh, their very difficult trial, and, and yet again, the Lord is proved kind and faithful uh, in their lives and in their walk. And listen, if you've been uh, a part of Harvest uh, York Region for any amount of time, you've already heard that the Christian life is a step-by-step -step walk of faith. And in the good times, that's not too hard to process. Kind of like, yeah, I get that. But what about in the difficult times? What about when the trials of life get heavy enough that you can't uh, think straight. Maybe that's because of a phone call in the middle of the night or a sudden reversal at work or some uh, family situation that you don't know what to do with or perhaps even uh, some pressure or even uh, persecution for your faith. And the questions always come. Where are you, God? What's going on here? How am I going to get through this? The title of the message today is Walking with God uh, When the Wheels Fall Off because the truth of the matter uh, is that all believers are going to experience some situations where that is exactly the problem. The wheels fell off my life and what am I going to do and where is the Lord in this? And in those situations, we need to be prepared about how to walk in his strength. And the good news today is God's word has lots to say about it and uh, we're going to be talking about that today. I want you to turn with me to 2 Kings uh, 18. It's about a quarter of the way through your Bible. And I want you to meet a man here who found himself in exactly the situation I've just been talking about. <clears throat> he was uh, the king of Judah, and he was under direct enemy attack from uh, the empire of the Assyrians, the, really the superpower of its day. And in fact, just check out this map. I want you to just have a little context. Uh, Judah is a itty-bitty country surrounded by that green area. You don't need to be able to read any of the cities on this map. I just want you to see the green area that represents Assyrian uh, control at this time. And uh, this king of Judah was in a situation from which it didn't look like there was any way out. Uh, this isn't going good and it's going south fast. And we're going to see in this story that it's going to give us here today in God's word some truths about walking with God in a crisis. Now the name of the guy is Hezekiah. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before. He's one of the few godly kings that you actually read about in the Old Testament, and his account uh, starts in 2 Kings chapter 18, uh, verse 1. I'm going to read just a little bit of the first few verses to set the stage uh, with you. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, you'll want to follow along uh, with me as we go, starting in verse 1. In the third year uh, of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Uh, scholars figure that this uh, was happening around 715 BC, so it's been about 300 years since King David uh, passed away. Then it says this, his mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3, 
And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Now, we haven't heard this evaluation in the book of Kings yet about, uh, about a king. Um, of all the 40-plus kings in the Old Testament, did you know this? 80% of them were evil. Only 20% of the kings of Israel received some form of good and of those, only two kings were centered out by the Lord uh, with his highest commendation, and Hezekiah is one of them, the highest commendation being a king just like David was, a man after God's own heart. Now, drop down to verse 5. Note this uh, summary verse. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was, note this, none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were uh, before him. Verse 7, and the Lord was with him wherever he went out, he prospered. Now we're going to work through the rest of the story uh, today and next week, but what you need to know is Hezekiah's story is one of the most remarkable stories in the Old Testament. And as a matter of fact, just a little uh, free trivia for you. The Bible considers this so important that it tells the entire story three different times in three different books. Did you know that? We find it here in 2 Kings 18. You also find it in its entirety in 2 Chronicles 29 to 32 and also in Isaiah chapter 36 to 39. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit is saying, Pay attention to what I'm doing in this man's life. Now, we're going to take two weeks to go through his whole story. And my aim as I go through it is I just want to glean in the field a bit and pick up some life principles for us about walking with God, but not just walking in general, but especially uh, in the hardest times of life. So if you're taking notes here, let's start with this first principle. Uh, my circumstances don't define what God might do in my life. My circumstances don't define what God might do in my life. One of the things I find really interesting about Hezekiah is that he didn't let his difficult circumstances or his family background stop him from having an incredible walk with the Lord. Now listen, he could have. He could have played the victim card. He could have played the, you have no idea what's going on in my life card. He could have played the, uh, my family is a dysfunctional mess card, but he didn't. Hezekiah understood what you and I need to understand, that my family background and my circumstances, no matter how bad they are, don't define me, and they don't limit what God might do in my life. And listen, some of you need to hear that this morning. I've been a pastor long enough that I've had people come up to me and say, Leo, if you only knew the place I came from, the family I grew up in, or, or if you only knew what was going on in my life, I, I just don't see how there's any real hope for me. Well, I want you to see what was going on with Hezekiah. Let's just talk about his family a bit. Uh, first, I want you to meet his father. It tells us in verse 1 uh, that his dad was a guy named King Ahaz, but we don't get much about it here. But I want you to flip back just a page or two in your Bible to chapter 16. Chapter 16 and starting in verse 2, I really want you to meet his dad because this will give you some insight into the kind of choices Hezekiah is about to make. Look at this, his dad. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He, note this, even burned his son as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. And you thought your dad was difficult, okay? Uh, the rest of chapter 16 is going to talk about the way that Hezekiah's father, he wasn't just wicked, he promoted wickedness among his own people. He recruited pe uh, people to wickedness. Imagine being raised in a family where your dad was so caught up in a cult that he would take one of his own sons and kill him as a sacrifice for his religion. Hezekiah is growing up in this kind of home. He's not going to hear anything about God in this home. No one's praying to the Lord at the dinner table here. 
I've heard people before in my own church uh, say to me at Harvest London, you know, Leo, sometimes I'm a little intimidated here. I look around and I see so many people that come from these Christian families where their parents were Christian and their grandparents were Christian and they're just, they're all so perfect and and they got this great heritage and I, I got none of that. None of it. And I feel... I feel like a second-class Christian. Is there any hope? Listen, it's not about your family background. God bless you if you've grown up in that, but you need to know it starts today with your own choices before the Lord. Hezekiah didn't let his family mess stop him from walking with the Lord. And then, then there's his immediate circumstances, okay? And for some of you coming today, you might be under a lot of pressure. Perhaps it's a work situation or a financial crisis. Maybe it's a health challenge. Maybe someone is working to discredit you because of what they feel about your faith. Well, for Hezekiah, you could say he had some mild job stress. Actually, uh, the king of this small country he is, and he's got the world's superpower breathing down his neck. And Assyria, by the way, was a brutal regime that just swept through the Middle East and gobbled up countries and nations in its path. And by the way, check out this map. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of uh, uh, where uh, Hezekiah was living and ruling. Now, Israel had by this point been divided into two. And you have the kingdom of Israel in the north, and uh, that kingdom was completely God, a a bunch of God-haters. They had rejected uh, the Lord a long time ago, not interested in him at all. And then down in the south, Judah, faring a little bit better, but uh, what we read in the Bible is they're at best lukewarm spiritually. And this is the country that he's got to lead. Now, let's find out a little bit about how God was dealing with Israel, uh, the country in the north. Look at verse 9 for the situation. It says this, In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, uh, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came against Samaria. That's actually uh, most of the area of the north in, uh, in Israel, and besieged it. And at the end of three years, he took it. Samaria was taken. Then, verse 11, note this. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria. And then just drop down to verse 12. Here's why. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. Okay. Imagine you're the king of this country. Your father's a write-off. You're, the Assyrians are breathing down your neck. Your brother country has abandoned God and brought God's own judgment on them. In fact, you don't need to uh, turn here, but in 2 second, in second Kings chapter 17, verse 18, it really gives us God's view of what was going on in Israel. It says, The Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah only. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. And you're the new king of this place, and you see your own lukewarm uh, people starting to go down uh, the, the road that Israel had. And listen, for Hezekiah, with all of this going on, there could have been this paralyzing sense of, what can I do? What can I do with this mess? What can one man really do? And the answer that we're going to see in the passage today is that one man, one woman can do what's right and live in a way that honors and pleases God. And God always responds to that. Doesn't matter your family background, doesn't matter your circumstances, they don't limit what God can do in your life. Here's the next thing I want you to see if you're taking notes. Jot this down. A walk marked by godly choices prepares me for future trials. A walk marked by godly choices prepares me for future trials. I want to just sort of get this settled right now with you. You want to have a strong walk with God? You want a deep relationship with him? You want to have a relationship with the Lord that when you go through trials, you'll be sensing his presence? Listen, it starts today. It starts with the choices that you make to honor him or not, choices for his glory or not, because listen, it's in those choices that bring you into the kind of deeper relationship that prepares you for tomorrow's trials. 
Don't wait until the crisis comes to suddenly wake up and go, I better get this thing going on between me and the Lord. Start today. Hezekiah understood this. In fact, we're going to see his actions, and I just want you to kind of see what he was doing. Man, this boy got busy for the Lord. I want you to see three things he did, and I'm just sort of applying them to my life. I'll start with this little principle. Tear down the idols that compete with God. Tear down the idols that compete with God. Look at verse 4. It says this. He removed the high places. Now, the high places were private altars people would set up in the hills uh, to have their own kind of private worship, however they wanted, worshiping whomever they wanted. It was kind of, they just sort of rejected their thing and created their own thing. And so Hezekiah went and removed them because they knew they were an abomination to God. Then it says, and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. Now, the pillars were idols uh, focused on the worship of Baal. And the Asherah poles were uh, places of worship for the sexual fertility cults of the Canaanite religion. And listen, if that didn't make him unpopular enough with his own people, what he does next will, says this. And he broke in pieces uh, the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called uh, Nehushtan. And what he did was he broke something that once had some value in the, in the nation. And if you remember the story, uh, it was way back in the time of Moses and there was a plague of, of serpents that came into the camp and God told Moses, listen, I want you to raise up a bronze and you tell the people that if they would just look to that serpent and trust in me, I will deliver them. And he did it. It was an incredible thing. And that... that symbol started to become something that people worshipped. It was actually a symbol to symbolize uh, Jesus. Jesus refers to this in John 3.14. It says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. But sadly, this symbol became something that people actually started to worship and they sacrificed to it and that was a form of idolatry. So Hezekiah takes this thing, he smashes it because he wants the people focused on God alone. Now I can't read verse 4 and not at least ask myself the question, are there some things in my life that have become idols that are competing with God? What things have become too important? What things are distracting me or even luring me away from growing in a deeper walk with God? What things have become so important that my own heart is saying, if I can't have that, if I can't be that, if I can't have that at the center of my life, I don't even want to live. Because when you answer that question, you found out what is becoming an idol. And what we're learning from Hezekiah is this is where it starts Tear down the idols that compete with God. God does great things in your life when you start there. Now, then he moves to this next thing, and I just said it this way. Develop a passion for God's gospel. Develop a passion for God's gospel. Now, uh, Jesus hasn't come yet. We haven't, uh, we don't, that's going to come in a few hundred years. But the message of repentance and trusting and turning to the Lord is all over uh, the Old Testament, and we see what Hezekiah does with that. He's a man living with a passion for God's gospel. Now, I, I want you to see how he feels about this, but I need you to turn to Second Chronicles 30 uh, to see it. So just turn about 50 pages to the right in your Bible. About 50 pages to the right, head towards the New Testament. I want you to read with me. This is uh, the same account, but uh, under inspiration of Scripture, the Holy Spirit inspired the writer of this book to add extra details. Now, this is that principle of Scripture interpreting Scripture, so it's a really good exercise we're doing here together. Second Chronicles 30 in verse 6. I want you to see Hezekiah sends a letter out to all of Judah and Israel uh, about getting right with God. Now, I want you to hear his passion. Look at verse 6. So couriers went throughout all Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his princes as the king had commanded, saying, O people of Israel, return to the Lord. Underline that word, return. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may turn again to the remnant of you, 
who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were faithless to the Lord, faithless to the Lord God of their fathers, so that he made them a desolation, as you see. Do not now be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield, yield yourselves to the Lord. He is preaching here. He's preaching right from the heart here. This is coming out of his own personal relationship with the Lord. And then it says, And come to his sanctuary, uh, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his fierce anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord... He's saying return to the Lord, yield to God, serve him... His message is no different than what is preached in this pulpit every weekend. Calling people to come, bow before King Jesus, embrace him, receive him by faith. To repent of your sin and turn to him and have him change you. That's that's the gospel. And what we're seeing here is Hezekiah is grounded in it and it shapes all of his choices. Grounded in the character of the Lord. And then it says, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land for the Lord your God, I love this, the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and he is, and he so is, and will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. And we're told that some people basically took his letter and tore it up and kind of went, but a bunch of people said, this is good news, I want this, and they all came down to Jerusalem, and it says, if you just drop down to verse 26, they, they come, and there's this historic time of worship, it says there, so that there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. And then the priests and the Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer, note this, came to his holy habitation in heaven. Revival breaks out in the country. God uses this man to bring about revival of his own people. It happened under his leadership. The depth of Hezekiah's passion for God and his gospel, I'm going to tell you something, was key to him later on being able to weather the storms he's about to face. Now, with both of those going on in his walk, he does this third thing we need to see. It's take a stand against God's enemies. Now flip back with me to 2 Kings 18. That's where I'm going to stay the rest of the message. 2 Kings 18. I want you to see what he does. It says in verse 7, And the Lord was with him wherever he went out. He prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. So his father uh, totally compromised. Hezekiah says, Not for me. I'm going to trust the Lord even though I can't see where this is going and I know it's going to cost me to rebel against the king. I wonder how many of you here today, maybe it's at school, maybe it's at work, maybe it's in your community, are aware that you're in a situation where God is calling you to take a stand for him. And it's a stand that might cost you something. It might cost your reputation. It might cost you some money. It might involve taking a stand against uh, ethics or anything else against the Lord. And, you, and there's a part of you going, how's this going to play out? What's going to happen? Is God going to be with me? And what we're going to see in the, in the case of Hezekiah is there is a cost and it's hard. And yet it's going to lead to his greatest blessing in his life. Verse 8. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its own territory from a watchtower to fortified city. And, of course, as soon as you hear the Philistines, you can think of another king who took a stand against God's enemies, the Philistines. And that's, of course, King David. And here Hezekiah is is living like King David in his passion for the Lord. Now, the longer I walk with the Lord, and I've been a believer now for about 35 years One thing has become clearer and clearer to me as the days go on and my hair recedes. And it's my daily choices to pursue the Lord and grow as a Christian. Okay, they're not just sort of independent choices. They're the very things that God is using in your life to prepare you for the kind of walk he has already in mind for you tomorrow. 
So there's a very in this moment kind of thing we need to hear as we're going through this uh, story. And let's see how this plays out in Hezekiah's life. This next principle will help you think about your choices. And here it is. God's evaluation of me needs to matter more. God's evaluation of me needs to matter more than it does now. And how many of us forget that God sees and he knows and he cares, not just about us in general, but he cares about what we're doing with the resources and the time that he has given to us. You realize Paul understood this in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Many of us have read this and some of us have memorized it, but what a good verse this is. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Hezekiah lived with that very sense of God being involved in everything that he did. Now, God has a perspective on us, okay? And and one of the things in the Bible that's pretty cool with all these kings is at the beginning of every one of their stories, God gives them a report card, okay? He gives us them an evaluation before the story comes, and I want you to hear the report card that Hezekiah gets from the Lord. You're going to see it starting in verse 5. And as I look at this report card, I kind of pull out three things that are good reminders to me of the things that God's looking for in my life. Here's the first thing. He's a man of faith. Verse 5 says, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. And I want you to just be reminded this morning that God is always searching for men and women whose hearts are trusting in him and looking at him. One of my favorite verses in the Bible I go to this verse an awful lot when I need to be reminded about my days. It says in 2 Chronicles 16.9 up on the screen, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. Hezekiah had this down. And then there's another thing I see in his life. It's uh, verse 6. He's loyal. Hezekiah was loyal to the Lord. See where it says there, For he held fast to the Lord. He held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. That word, a phrase, held fast, is from a Hebrew word that the last time we saw it in this book was when it was talking about a guy named Solomon, and it, said, and it was used in a bad way. And it said that Solomon held fast to his foreign wives and rejected the Lord. And here we're seeing the opposite. Hezekiah holds fast to the Lord. He clings to the Lord. That loyalty is something the Lord loves to bless. And then there's a third thing it says about him in this report card. It says that he was obedient. Okay, not perfect, but obedient. Look at verse 6. But he kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses So these are the three things God's looking for. He's looking for a heart to trust him. He's looking for loyalty to him that clings to him and obedience that follows him. And look at how God responds to this. Verse 7, and the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. Question. Does Does the truth that God knows and sees and evaluates has that sunk in for you? Does that, ever, does that ever just come into the screen of your mind and affect the way you think about your priorities, your choices, what you're doing, where you're going, how you're living? Does that filter in? Because what we're seeing in Hezekiah is it needs to be. Sometimes I think that we fall into this habit of viewing God the way we view our family physician in our annual checkup. Okay, and uh, you know, we kind of think that maybe once a year God will touch base with us and do a little, how are we doing, and here's what I like, here's what I don't like, and then for the rest of the year we kind of, you know, we tune out on him and he tunes out on us. That's not the case. We all have to make our own choices for his glory or not. And one of the things in the Bible is that every, every generation makes its own choice. You know what's interesting here is Hezekiah's dad Ahaz was a total write-off. 
You'd think, oh, nothing good going to come out of that family. And then, boom, Hezekiah, his son, loves the Lord, worships him, serves him. But sadly, what we're going to see if you keep reading in the story is Hezekiah's own son, Manasseh, becomes the worst king in the history of Israel. And just when you thought that was over, two kings later, under Manasseh, his grandson, Josiah, is raised up just like Hezekiah and loves the Lord. Every generation makes its own choice. And, and listen, young people here today, I want you to understand, if, if, uh, if you come from a Christian home, your parents love the Lord, that's a great treasure. I'm thankful for that. But, you, but don't be thinking that because of their faith, you can sort of ride their coattails and that counts as your faith. You have to make a personal decision about whether you're going to follow the Lord and build your life on the rock or not. And the same thing in terms of whether you come from a family that doesn't have that going on or not. Every generation makes its own choices. Now, all of that makes what happens next a little bit surprising. I didn't see this coming in the story, to be honest with you. Here's the fourth thing. Walking faithfully with God doesn't exempt me from the crisis. Walking faithfully with God doesn't exempt me uh, from the crisis. Coming to the end of verse 8, you'd almost think to yourself, well, hey, this guy's just got it going on. I mean, he's a godly man just like Elijah, and God's blessing him and prospering him wherever he goes, and he's, he just does everything right, and you almost expect to see a verse that says, and he lived happily ever after. And your mind's preparing you for that. I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't come. In fact, um, I don't need you to s uh, flip there, but the, the, uh, the other account in Second Chronicles tells us this. I just want you to hear it from me. Here, here's what it says happens after Hezekiah does all these things for the Lord. It says, Second Chronicles 32.1, After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, I'm going to say that again. After all that Hezekiah had so faithfully done, the king of Assyria came and invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. And you're reading this and you're like, what? Are you telling me, are you telling me that if I trust the Lord, if I'm loyal to the Lord, if I obey the Lord, the Lord Assyria still invades? Because I thought if I did everything right, if I was the perfect Christian, if I was faithful, Assyria, my enemies, problems, trials, challenges, suffering would never come. And isn't it true? Deep down inside all of our hearts, there is a place, there is a voice that kind of says to us, when trials come, Lord, haven't I earned a pass on this? How can you allow this to happen? I've been so faithful even though we've been told in the Bible so many times that even, even God will walk with us through trials, but we're not always exempted from them. Jesus himself said in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I think what I like about Hezekiah is I kind of relate to him because there, he kind of loses it now. Okay, and, and I love the fact that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat characters. It, gi it gives it to us in their real uh, form. And Hezekiah, when the invasion happened, he, he just panics and he, he kind of loses it. And, and in verse 14, we see him start to compromise. Read this with me. Verse 14, 2 Kings 18. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, saying... I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah strip, stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. This is shocking. Hezekiah is going into the temple, into the house of the Lord, and he's like melting down gold and stealing all, anything of value to pay off the enemy. What's he doing? He's trusting in his flesh. 
He's thinking pragmatically about a problem uh, and, and, and doing whatever he can to solve it in his own way. There's no sense of prayer here. There's no sense of leaning into the Lord. It's all him. Does it work? Well, I'm not going to read all of it from there on, but the reality is it doesn't. Assyria takes all the money, says thank you very much, and then kicks in the door further and totally takes over uh, the country. Now, if I were to stop there, that would be a pretty depressing message. What do you got for me, Leo? Where is this going? What do I do with this? If walking faithfully doesn't always exempt me from the crisis, where do I go? Here's this fifth thing. I want you to see this. There's a lot of wisdom here. Jot this down. I must become wise to the nature of spiritual attacks. I must become wise to the nature of spiritual attacks. One of the things we find out when we read the Bible is it says that Christians live in a war zone. And we face uh, real enemies. And sometimes the attack of the enemy is open and obvious, and other times it's more stealthy. In fact, the Bible says we have three enemies as Christians. There's our own flesh. And that uh, battle is the battle of putting sin to death. Then there's the systems of the world, which is all the ungodly systems that war against Christ in us. But the Bible also tells us that we have an enemy in the devil. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When the enemy attacks, he has just one goal. He wants to undermine your faith in the Lord. He will do anything he can to destabilize and undermine your ability to trust and lean in to the Lord. In verse 19, the enemy sends an ambassador to confront Hezekiah. And uh, he gives this huge speech, which is aimed at undermining Hezekiah's faith. And I'm going to go through it a bit, but what you're going to see here is this is one of the most blasphemous speeches in all the Bible. Okay? Think the way Satan was talking to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Think Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. There's echoes of Satan's assault on our faith in this very speech. So we're going to look at it. Starting in verse 19, it says, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? And right away he's asking actually a very good question, and it's this. Who are you trusting in? Who are you relying on? And the enemy will always get you to feel that there's nothing to trust in. The Lord's calling you you, to to trust in him. But that is the key question. Now, I'm going to take you through the speech, and I'm going to give you what I'm going to call a blueprint for a spiritual attack. The enemy is not creative. It's the same themes over and over again in the Bible. There are some themes that we see in this speech that help us be wise to the nature of a spiritual attack. There's wisdom in this. Okay, let me go through them. Here's the first thing. The enemy will say, your resources aren't enough. Despair. Your resources aren't enough. Despair. Look at verse 20. It says, do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, You are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. See, he's saying your situation's hopeless. You can't help you. Your friends can't help you. You only have one option, despair. And that's the way the enemy tries uh, to attack. That's not how the Lord ever speaks to his children. Even in the darkest night, in the difficult, most difficult trial, the Lord says, of course you don't have the resources for this. But I do. And I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. The enemy never wants us to believe that. Here's the second thing in the blueprint for the spiritual attack. The enemy says, your God's not on your side even. Despair. Notice now how he starts distorting and twisting the truth of the Lord. Verse 22, it says... But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it actually not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before his altar in Jerusalem? See, he's lying here. He's saying, God's mad at you for taking those idols down. Totally twisting, lying. Verse 25. Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? 
The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. He's saying, God's not even on your side. God works for me. I speak for God. My word is law. You're all alone, Hezekiah. The enemy is always attempting to distort God's word. He's always trying to distort your understanding of God's character. And that's why, folks, let me just say it again. Take advantage of every resource this church here has to offer you to grow in your depth and understanding of God's word. What a gift this is to you. It's designed to strengthen you because you need to be wise and discerning, not just for life, but for these attacks of the enemy. Here's the third thing he does, trying to wear Hezekiah down. He says, your, your reputation will suffer despair. He wants to target Hezekiah's friends now. He wants Hezekiah to be insecure about what the people will think. And he says this in verse 29. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. This is just total propaganda at this point. He's just continuing to lie. Then this fourth thing, compromise will be offered. Escape. The enemy's always attempting to give you a way out if you would just turn from the Lord. And actually, isn't it always true that in the most difficult times of waiting on God, when things look really bleak, somehow, suddenly, always, something looks so good over there. Listen to what he says in verse 31. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. And then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. A land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey that you may live and not die. Sounds so tempting. This is almost like an advertisement for a Royal Caribbean cruise, for crying out loud. Reject the Lord. Bow down to me, worship me, and I will give you all this. Have we heard this before in the Bible somewhere? This is how the enemy talks. Finally, and, 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 and as a last resort, this is what he resorts to when the other ones don't work. Your God doesn't even matter. Your God doesn't matter. Despair. Verse 33. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of three cities I can't pronounce? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have ever delivered their lands out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Bottom line, there is no God. He's no different than the useless idols of all the other nations around it. Now, why would God give us this speech in the Bible? Here's why. He wants to give you a blueprint, some insight in how the enemy will use every means to push you to despair and not hope in God. The enemy wants you to believe these five things in your own life, these things that are not true, they're lies. Hezekiah understood this. Despite his previous failure, he was steeped in the Lord and he understood the ways of the Lord. And what happens next is so amazing. Verse 36, you think the people are going to fall apart and it says, but the people were silent and answered him, not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. And uh, they didn't panic, they didn't melt, they didn't fall apart. Why? Hezekiah understood how the enemy was going to act and he equipped them, which is what I'm trying to do with you right now. So, what's Hezekiah going to do? I'm just going to close today with this final thought. It sets up our time together next weekend, but I want you thinking about this a lot this week, and it's this, if you're taking notes, number six. Decide in advance where you're going to turn. Decide in advance where you're going to turn. Next week, we're going to find out how Hezekiah sought the Lord, and we're going to learn some powerful principles on prayer and how God responds to prayer. It's amazing. But I want you to just notice this first verse in chapter 19, verse 1. 
Would you just catch this with me? As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Went into the house of the Lord. Okay? That's his decision. Such a, actually, that's a simple statement you might just breeze by if you're reading the Bible. He went into the house of the Lord. You know, how we respond in our crises is often a good indicator of how we're doing with the Lord. This isn't just some random thing he thought of. This is an intentional act of saying, I've already decided that this is where I go when the wheels have fallen off. I go to God. I got to hear from the Lord. I got to get before the Lord. And he's not just going to any old church building like ours, but he went to the temple, which in the old covenant was the place of a special place of God's glory and presence. And instead of running from God, he moves towards him. How often in our lives, when the wheels fall off, do we run from him? And we find all sorts of things to run from. We, we run to distractions to keep us preoccupied. We run to entertainment. We run to our toys that we've surrounded our lives with so that we can sort of feel better about things or little idols that we've created. We run to substances. I want you to know this morning, every one of those things is a false savior, a false hope. Everything good that happens next week in Hezekiah's life happens because of this one decision Everything good that God's going to do in and through and for Hezekiah happens because of this one choice to press into the Lord by faith and not to run. Here's my question to you today. Have you already decided? Have you already decided where you're going to turn when the wheels of life fall off? Is that settled for you? You know, even without hearing the rest of the story, the good news uh, this morning is, is that the gospel itself, the gospel of Jesus Christ is such encouraging news regardless of your situation. Do you know that if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, God has made some incredible promises to you? You see, as good of a, a, sto- uh, a king as King Hezekiah was, he was just a man who made mistakes, but he was a shadow pointing to the ultimate king, the true son of David that was going to come, King Jesus. And what I love is if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible promises you that he is sovereignly and intimately ruling and reigning in your life right now. And as amazing as the temple was that Hezekiah ran to when he wanted to get with God, do you know that if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible actually says that you're now his temple and his Holy Spirit, his presence is in you. And because of Jesus, you have access to the Lord right now in this moment where you can find grace and mercy to find and help uh, help in time of need. So with all of that at your disposal... Why would you turn anywhere else when the wheels come off? Decide today. Decide today where you're going to turn in a crisis. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that yet again in your word we can find our hearts and our eyes lifted up to you and to see you in your glory and your majesty and your power, but Lord, also to see you as intimately interested in our lives. To find, Lord, a God who is merciful and gracious, who loves us. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to worship right now around the room, I know in so many people's hearts there are going to be prayers lifted to you about situations they're in. Wheels have fallen off in certain places in our lives. I pray, God, that as we sing, as we praise you, as we rest in your presence, God, that you would be at work doing the, the thing that only you can do in our lives. Amen.